All of abstract mathematics is built upon three logical constructions. For all, there exists and implies. In this video, we'll learn to think of each one as a sort of logical transaction, discussing all three in terms of what they mean, how they're proven, and how we can use such a statement in our own proofs. Before going into the formal mechanics of these constructions, let's briefly discuss the intuitive meaning of each one. We'll illustrate their meanings by examples using the context of the set S below, whose elements are shapes of various colors. Of course, most of mathematics involves numbers, functions, and more complicated objects, but the meanings of our three logical constructions are the same regardless of the sort of element we're talking about. One thing that we do in mathematics is to make sweeping statements about all objects in some set. For example, in our set S of shapes, every element of S is a polygon. We use the for all statement to express this. The statement for all x q of x means that the statement q of x is true for each and every value of the variable x. Here, x is a variable, which could stand for anything, and q is some logical statement about x. The upside down capital letter A is a common symbol used to abbreviate for all. And it's nice because it's a brand new logical symbol that doesn't carry any baggage with it like regular words from the English language do. Our statement that every shape in S is a polygon would be written as, for all x in S, x is a polygon. This statement is true because one x at a time, we could check that each and every shape in S is indeed a polygon. Of course, not every for all statement is true. The statement that for all x in S, x is a triangle is a well formed for all statement. It just happens to be false, which we can see because there's at least one shape in the set that's not a triangle. A second thing we do in mathematics is to state that at least one object in some set has a certain property. For example, that there is a hexagon in our set S. We use the there exists statement to express this. There exists x such that q of x means that for at least one x, the statement q of x is true. Again, x is a variable, and q of x is some statement about x. The symbol we use here is a backwards capital E, which is simply read there exists. Note that what we put between the variable and the statement serves no logical function. It's just there to make the statement read smoothly. That middle bit could be such that, or for which, or with, or all sorts of other phrases. It could even be a colon, or we could leave it off altogether. But no matter how we write it, the logical interpretation of this statement is the same. Our statement that one of the shapes in our set S is a hexagon can be written as, there exist x and s such that x is a hexagon. This statement is true because, well, there is a hexagon. Note that it's possible for there to be more than one such x. All we need is for there to be at least one of them. On the other hand, we can observe that none of these shapes is a pentagon. The statement that there exists x and s such that x is a pentagon is a well-formed there exists statement. It just happens to be false because we can see that not a single one of these shapes is a pentagon. Our final basic need in mathematics is to express a logical relationship between two statements. For example, if a shape in S is yellow, then we can conclude that it must be a triangle. Such a logical relationship is expressed by the implies or if then statement P implies Q, which says that if the hypothesis P is true, then the conclusion Q must also be true. The arrow with two horizontal strokes is simply read implies. This is a different sort of statement than our previous two in the sense that it doesn't directly involve a variable. The simplest way to visualize its meaning is via a Venn diagram. We think of P being true just when we're inside the yellow disk, and Q being true just when we're inside the gray disk. The statement that P implies Q means that if we're in the yellow disk, we must also be in the gray disk. In other words, the yellow disk for P lies entirely inside the gray disk for Q. Our original observation is expressed in writing by the statement that x is yellow implies x is a triangle. This is an example of a true implication because in the set S, a shape being yellow does force it to be a triangle. The statement that x is a triangle implies x is yellow is also a well-formed implication. However, we can see that this implication is false because not every triangle in S is yellow. We can explicitly refute this implication by pointing out what's called a counterexample, in which the hypothesis is true but the conclusion is false. For example, this shape in S is a triangle, but is not yellow. This single counterexample explicitly demonstrates that the hypothesis is not sufficient to imply the conclusion, and thus that the implication is false. Two quick notes about implications are in order. First of all, order is crucial to the meaning of an implication. P implies Q, 
and Q implies P mean quite different things. The direction of the arrow should help to remind us of this. We can observe this in the two examples we just saw. X being yellow implies that X is a triangle, but not vice versa. Also, we can see that the Venn diagram for Q implies P looks quite different than the one for P implies Q. Second, an implication in general makes no assertion about what happens when the hypothesis is false. In the Venn diagram, P being false puts us outside the inner circle. But that's not enough to tell in general whether we're inside the circle for Q or not. Going back to our example, if X is not yellow, we can't conclude whether or not it's a triangle. Again, an implication only tells us what happens if the hypothesis is true, and nothing about what happens when the hypothesis is false. Believe it or not, almost all of the logical definitions we use in mathematics are built from these three basic constructions, so we'll want to learn them quite well. We've seen examples of what these statements mean and gain some intuitive sense of them. But what are our mechanics for handling them in formal proofs? As we move into this more abstract setting, Friedrich Nietzsche has some advice for us. Je abstrakter die Wahrheit ist, die du lehren wirst, umso mehr musst du noch die Sinne zu ihr verführen. In English, the more abstract the truth you wish to teach, the more you need to seduce the senses to it. If we want to apply this principle to our three logical constructions, which we really should, we'll need to introduce a way of seeing what's going on in the logic of a proof. We'll do this by treating the two sorts of ingredients used in our logical constructions as tangible tokens to move around. First, objects, which we'll represent by variables. For example, these could be numbers, sets, functions, or any other thing we're studying. And second, statements, such as equations, inequalities, and other logical assertions. Every well-formed statement is either true, which we'll indicate by the color green, or false, which we'll indicate by the color red. In terms of these tokens, our three logical constructions essentially act as vending machines. Each one performs a different sort of logical transaction in terms of what you put into it and what comes out. One at a time, we'll see what each one of our constructions does, then discuss how it operates on the inside, which corresponds to how we prove it, and how we operate it from the outside, which corresponds to how we use it in a proof. The statement for all x q of x means that for any x that's given, the statement q of x is true. In terms of our tokens, this statement acts like a coin operated vending machine. If you feed it a value for x, it gives you back the statement q of x as a true fact for your use. Again, its input is an object, a value of x, and its output is the verified statement q of x. The way that we prove such a statement simply puts into words what we did earlier with our set of shapes. We need to take whatever value of x is given to us and deduce that the statement q of x is true. Let's see what needs to happen inside the box to make this transaction happen and how we express that in writing to produce a direct proof of the statement. First, we need to accept the value x that's given to us, remembering that we, inside the box, don't get to choose it. This is most often said with a particular phrase, let x be given. We must passively accept whatever x is given to us. We have no control over its value in the proof once it's given to us, so our proof must work independent of what value of x we're given. Once we've introduced x into our proof, we then need a sequence of valid logical steps, concluding with the deduction that q of x is true, which is what our box spits out. A quick word about that variable x in the proof. The reason that we can't know its value in the proof is that our proof should work whatever x token is put in. If that variable x stays pure throughout the proof, we could take whatever value we like and plug it in for all of the x's in the entire argument, and voila, we have the logic justifying the statement q of x for that value of x. If we'd ever assigned a value to that variable ourselves, we'd lose the ability to do this, and our proof wouldn't necessarily work for all x. That in a nutshell is the template for directly proving a statement of the form for all x q of x. Passively let x be given, then work logically to deduce that q of x is true. If we know that the statement for all x q of x is true, and we want to use it in a proof, we simply need to express in writing what this box does as viewed from the outside. Again, there's a particular way to say this. The for all statement will accept any x's input, so to use this statement, we first explicitly declare what value of x we'd like to feed it, with wording such as take x equals blah. Note that the choice of x is active and entirely ours. This is why when we proved the statement, we had to passively accept whatever x was given to us, 
the two sides of the transaction work hand in hand. Once we've declared the X we're using, we simply reference the statement that we know is true, which allows us to conclude that the statement Q of X is true for our chosen X. If we mark the statement we're using, we can just say, by star, Q of X is true. Again, it's a simple process to use a for all statement. Simply declare the value of x that you want to apply the statement to, and reference it as your justification that q of x is true for your value of x. The logical transaction for a there exists statement is quite different. It doesn't take any input at all. We just figuratively press the button to activate it, and it gives us both a value x and a verified statement q of x about that value x. The treatment of x in this transaction is exactly the opposite of how it went with the for all statement. Before we put in an x of our choosing, and now the x is given to us by the box. This makes the way we prove it and use it quite different. The way that we prove such a statement puts into words what we did earlier with our set of shapes. To prove that there existed a hexagon, we needed to find one and verify that indeed it was a hexagon. Thinking about what the box does, Let's see what must happen inside for that to happen. Expressing this in words is how we will prove a there exists statement. Before we even start the proof itself, we need to find a value x that makes the statement q of x true. How we find that x depends on what q of x says, and our method for finding x is not even part of the proof. In this one step, all rules are off. We often use the statement q of x to figure out a value for x, even though we haven't justified that q of x is true yet. Our scratch work to find x can use algebra, guess and check, correct or even incorrect logic, or simply blind inspiration. The how is literally irrelevant to the proof. All that matters is that we can somehow, by hook or by crook, find a value x for which q of x is true. Note that the value of x is our choice in the proof, unlike the first step in the proof of a for all statement. We get to choose the x inside the box, and outside the box the user simply has to accept it. With our x in hand, the first line of the proof itself just actively declares the value of x we want to take. Take x equals whatever explicit value we've found to get started. We don't need to give any reason or justification for the x we take. All that matters is that the rest of the proof works for that value of x. Once we've declared the value of x we're taking, the proof is very much like our for all proof. We use a sequence of logical steps, concluding with the deduction that q of x is true for our chosen x. The good news is that whatever work we did to find our x, which need not even be valid, can often be read in reverse as a script for the steps in our justification of q of x, which must be logically sound. Our box spits out this verified statement, along with our chosen value of x. To recap, proving that there exists statement consists of one preliminary step, finding an x by any means we like, which is not part of the proof. Then we simply take that value for our x in our proof, and work to logically deduce that q of x is true for that value of x. The statement there exists x such that q of x is the easiest one to use, because we don't have to do anything on the outside of the box other than figuratively press the button. That outcome x and q of x. In a proof, we'll express this in words. Labeling the exist statement, we now passively take x as in star, and conclude that, for this given value of x, q of x is true. As we said earlier, the implication p implies q is a different sort of logical construction than our first two, not directly involving variables, only statements. As a logical transaction, this operates as another sort of vending machine. If you feed it the verified statement p, then it spits out the verified statement q. There are quite a few ways to prove implications, but we'll just discuss the direct proof of p implies q. Given what we see in the box does, Let's see what needs to happen inside to achieve this and see how to express it in words. We start a direct proof of p implies q with the statement suppose p, meaning that we're assuming that p is true. This is a valid assumption because our statement only asserts what happens when p is true. This first line is important as we presumably will need to use the fact that p is true in order to prove that q is true. This might feel very similar to how we proved the for all statement. The only difference is that instead of letting a value x be given, we suppose that the statement p is true as our starting point. From this point forward, the structure of the proof looks much like our last two. We use a sequence of logical steps, concluding with the deduction that q is true, which is what our box needs to spit out. 
To summarize, a direct proof of p implies q starts by supposing that p is true, which represents accepting the green token p, and after some logical argument, ends with the conclusion that q is true, which is the token that the box outputs. Using this implication simply amounts to stating in words exactly what this transaction looks like from the outside of the box. If we know that p implies q is true, and want to use it in a proof, we should start by clearly stating that p is true, giving a reason why if necessary. Labeling the implication, we can then deduce that because the implication is true, and its hypothesis p is true, its conclusion q must be true as well. In short, justify p and conclude q using that and the implication. That's it for our quick run through of these three basic logical constructions. If you look carefully, you'll see that all of the definitions in abstract mathematics are built from them. The goal of this video is to present a concrete way of understanding the logical mechanics of these constructions to get you started. The smoother you get with these basic mechanics, the more you'll be able to focus on all of the mathematics that they allow us to build. If you use the mechanics you've learned here in your own proofs, and watch for them, even though they might be paraphrased in proofs you read, you'll be on the road to fluency with the language of abstract mathematics.